we start. So welcome to the second talk of the colloquium. Uh, let me say a few words about Professor Peter Kuschment. Uh, he obtained his PhD in uh, 1973 in Harkov State University. And then uh, in Kiev in 1983, his science doctor in the Academy of Science of Kiev, he obtained a doctor of science degree, which in the well, in Ukraine is a second doctorate, which is much more demanding than the first one. And he's been uh, with the University of Texas A&M since 2001, where he's a distinguished professor. And uh, he works in many fields, in uh, partial differential equations, mathematical physics, in uh, computerized tomography, non-destructive testing. In this area, he's one of the leading um, researchers. He also has written books and uh, particularly a book in quantum graph that is a, a standard reference. Well, he's actually a member of the Harko School in Mathematics, which is a distinguished school with uh, Phil Medalist, uh, Lucy Marchenko, a, a host of mathematicians come from that very special school. And uh, today, oh, he also works in geometric analysis. And then today he will give a talk in the nodal count Mystery. So, Professor Cushman. And I have to apologize, noble Espanol, so don't get misled by this. And if you find errors, uh, you should blame Google Translate on that. <laughs> I should have asked my daughter to check since she is a fluent Spanish speaker, but I forgot. So, it's all errors, including mathematical, you address to Google Translate. <laughs> So I will be, uh, my talk will be less technical. Uh, in, in fact, I will commit a crime of not providing a single proof. There will be no proof. Uh, there is a rule that you should have at least small proof in lecture, but the proofs are pretty heavy here. But before I start, I want to uh, express our sympathy to people from from people to, of Texas to people to Mexico for this terrible event uh, that happened and stay strong please and and no wall <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, quick description of what I will be talking about uh, first of all I will um, mention what are nodal patterns of eigenfunctions then I will uh, list uh, briefly what are the main issues people consider. It is a very hot area now, and uh, most questions are still unresolved. Uh, then I will concentrate on one specific uh, issue that I have dealt with, nodal count, uh, and provide some results there. I will not discuss them here. So first of all, nodal patterns, ha they have been known since, uh, I don't know when, at least since Leonardo da Vinci. And I bet that you all have heard either in physics or in mathematics about them. And they were studied by, they were observed by Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, Robert Hooke made presentation about them at Royal Society. Uh, usually they are attributed to Ernst Chladny, who you see was far from being the first. Uh, Robert Hooke did the same thing at least 100 years before. And this is uh, the, pictures, the picture of an experiment that you may or may not have seen. Essentially, what you have, you have a drum. It could be of different shape, for instance, it's just a membrane. Uh, it could be round, it could be square, it could be any shape. And it, you place this drum, meaning you make it oscillating with certain frequency. And what you do, you put either sand or chalk dust on this membrane. And what happens is that some parts of the membrane stay stationary, they don't move. And so the sand 
con congregates at those places. And these are the uh, Chladni patterns or nodal patterns. And they de depend strongly on the shape of the membrane. You see, for instance, round and square, and the shapes of those uh, nodal patterns are different. And they also depend on the frequency. And those things have been known for a long time, and studied for a long time, and used for a long time. Oh, so wrong button. For instance, more nodal patterns. This, this is one of the nodal patterns of a square membrane. This is violin-shaped membrane. And actually, those things are practically used. It's not just for fun, we have violin shape. Uh, uh, this is uh, so-called Bunimovich Stadium. That's a, a very simple object, essentially rectangle with two half circles added. But this is famous since it, it's one of the main studied examples of what is called quantum chaos. And you see nodal patterns here. And this is a whole bunch of nodal patterns you can get on the square. And you see that they are very manifold. There are quite a few shapes. and It's the whole world of possibilities. And here are uh, nodal patterns for a guitar. And they are, again, practically used. And here you have the frequency of oscillation, the frequency of sound. And you can notice some things that we will refer to later. For instance, uh, you can have a uh, much higher frequency of sound, like 175 hertz, uh, with the same number of pieces. Like, for instance, here you have four. So what is drawn? I've, I'm sorry, I didn't say. The places where the sand congregates are those curves or lines. And the pieces into which they split your domain are called nodal domains. So this has four nodal domains. And uh, the nodal set is kind of a curved cross. This also has four nodal domains, uh, although the frequency of sound is much higher. And uh, in principle, kind of uh, some rule of thumb is that the higher frequencies, the more nodal domains you have. But you will see that, unfortunately, it's not nearly as simple. It does tend to have more nodal domains, you see, for high frequencies. But it is exactly the mystery about which I will be talking about. So first of all, mathematically, what it is? You have a bounded domain. Let us think of two-dimensional domain with smooth boundary. It doesn't matter whether it's two-dimensional or in higher dimensions. Actually, it could be Riemannian manifold or bounded domain in Riemannian man manifold. But all this doesn't make big difference, since, as you will see, main issues are not resolved for planar flat domains yet. So what you have here? You have an uh, eigenvalue problem for a Laplace equation. So uh, lambda is eigenvalue. And on the boundary, you have Dirichlet condition 0. Uh, mechanically, this means that you have a drum whose boundary is fixed, like it happens in the real drums. And you play it with the frequency lambda. And u, the function u, is the shape uh, that uh, the drum takes with this frequency. Um, and this u is called uh, eigenfunction. And uh, it is well known that there is uh, the spectrum of uh, possible frequencies. These are pure tones you can play on your instruments. You know there are pure tones, and everything else is the mixture. Different drums play, di or different violins play different pure tones. And uh, this spectrum of, of eigenvalues is discrete, goes to infinity. And I denote by psi n eigenfunction solution here that uh, corresponds to this lambda. Uh, each eigenvalue has f might have multiplicity, but it's finite multiplicity. And now 
what is a nodal set? Nodal set is where your eigenfunction turns out to be equal to zero. That's exactly the places where sand congregates. The membrane doesn't move there. So the nodal set. And uh, notations are used, sometimes you label it by the number of eigenfunction in the spectrum. So you label it from in increasing order of lambdas. Or you can label it with the value, with the eigenvalue lambda. And what are nodal domains? Like, like before, this Z nodal set splits your domain omega into connected pieces, and they are called nodal domains. In other words, uh, I will return to the picture in a second. In other words, uh, in each nodal domain, your eigenfunction doesn't change sign. It's either positive or negative. And it changes sign only going across the nodal set where it turns to zero. So these are the places where the eigenfunction keeps the sign. Uh, OK. Uh, those things are studied nowadays everywhere in mathematical physics, in number theory, and even in medical imaging. I could have given not one, but the whole series of lectures explaining problems of medical imaging that uh, lead to this. Also, by the way, unresolved, some of them. And what can you study? The standard laundry list of things that you study about those uh, is, first of all, how, what is the local structure of those nodal sets? How does they look locally? I, can they be really nasty, fractal? I don't know. What, what is the local picture? And there are things that are very easy. First, uh, the first, of all, first of all, one can prove that, uh, let me talk about two-dimensional case. There are things are similar in any dimension and remain in manifolds. Those uh, nodal sets consist of infinitely differentiable pieces as it can intersect. But when they intersect, they, they are not allowed to intersect in any nasty way. They intersect transversely, that cannot get tangent. Moreover, the angle that they make should be that stops working. Doesn't react. Okay. It it does react here on the computer. I don't think so. It it operates on computer. Computer reacts to this, but something is wrong with the screen, with the connection to the screen. So the intersection angles uh, have have to be very special. The intersection angle has to be commensurate with two pi. For instance, it could be 2 pi over 5, but it cannot be, cannot have irrational ratio with pi. And the reason is that it's a very nice exercise for students. If you don't know this, uh, you can prove that if you have a harmonic function, Laplacian of u is 0. And y you look at the 0 set of this harmonic function, and if there is intersection of those zero sets, you can prove that intersection angle should divide to pi, essentially. And this is not hard. This is an easy part. I wish everything, everything else were that easy. Another thing is, and I will not touch this, it is a big story and still not understood well, uh, how curved the nodal sets could be. You saw an example that could be really cu curved. But uh, there is an observation that if you have many eigenfunctions simultaneously vanishing on, this, on the same set, it should be flat. In 2D, it should be a straight line. And that's exactly what appears also in, uh, in different areas. For instance, Bourguin, the, uh, this is the first Fields Prize winner appearance here on the list. There will be three at least doing these things. 
uh, Bergen and Rednik did this for number theory reasons, and we did this for uh, medical imaging reason. By the way, this is different Ambertsumian from yesterday's Ambertsumian. It's young guy. So this is a really hard and not well understood thing, but I will not get into that. Then how large could be the nodal set? In what sense? Nodal set, you can argue it, it's not, it's a zero set of a single function in Rn, it should be n minus one dimensional sub, subset. In the, on the plane, it should be curves. So how do you measure the size? You, you compute the length of the curves. In higher dimension, in dimension n, you, you will get not curves by surfaces, you compute their surface area. So in other words, uh, wrong buttons. In other words, you take the uh, nodal set for some y eigenvalue lambda and compute. This is Hausdorff measure. It's, you, you just compute n minus one-dimensional volume of this set, and the conjecture of Yao, that's the second Fields Prize winner, appearing in this study, uh, is that when lambda is large then the size of this nodal set behaves like square root of lambda. And uh, it's not hard to guess this thing. Uh, what, the, what does this uh, tilde mean? It, uh, that there are two-sided estimates. This thing should, shouldn't be bigger than constant times square root of lambda. It shouldn't be less than constant times square root of lambda. This is far from being proven. Uh, it, uh, it is proven in the case when everything is analytic, analytic uh, manifolds, etc. And it was proven by the third uh, Fields Prize winner appearing in the study, Charles Pfefferman with Donnelly. In the smooth case, it is still widely open thing. And there are estimates of this thing both from above and from below of this measure. But if you look how different they are, there is a whole world gap between them. They should be the same, but up to a constant. But it is very far from being proven. It's a very active area, and any progress is widely appreciated. So it is very hard thing, and there are many you can see, you probably recognize, at least depending on your area, some of the names like Peter Sarnak, or Rudik, number theory, and Zeldich in analysis, and many others, Kolding in, in geometry. Again, I, I will not deal with this. I will deal with this red uh, question. How many nodal pieces can eigen, eigen, eigen function have? You remember we noticed on examples that sometimes the ballpark idea is that the higher is the pitch, the higher is the lambda, the more nodal pieces you see, but we saw counterexamples. And again, this is a very active area. And let me tell you, uh, both in mathematics and physics, because there are physicists who contributed a lot, uh, so let, I will dwell exactly on this issue. And we'll see that this is already something that is hard to understand and not completely understood. There are simplest questions not answered. Okay. And there are also inverse problems, which I will not be discussing. Uh, you can try to tell something about your drum if you know nodal set. And there have been studies like that, but I will not uh, deal with them. Now, about generic situation. So, uh, w how generically should the nodal sets look like? First of all, on the square, you can easily cook up eigenfunction as a product of sine of x and sine of y, with sine of mx and sine of nx. And then you can easily find the zeros, and what you get is grid. By the way, if you compute the length of this grid and compare with the eigenvalue, you easily come to Yao's conjecture about the size of, 
of uh, it will give you what Yao suggested is true always. However, this is non-generic situation in the sense what happens if instead of square you you change the shape a little bit, or if you are on the minimal manifold you change the metric a little bit, or you add potential to your you you take Schrodinger operator instead of Laplace add potential of your x. So you perturb your problem a little bit. What happens generically is probability one kind of. And it was proven first by Albert and then in much better and conclusive way by Karen Ullenbeck that generically, first of all, all eigenvalues are simple. There is no multiplicity. On the square, if you compute those products of signs, you see huge multiplicity eigenvalues. Generically, there is no multiplicity. Generically, all uh, eigenfunctions, all nodal sets are smooth. They don't intersect. So this is how it looks generically. This is a small perturbation of that. If you change the shape a little bit, chances are most probably with probability one, you will end up with something like that. You see, they know the lines will split where the intersections. They will avoid intersection. And then you will have the eye colored different nodal domains. Uh, this is one, this is another, this is another, etc. So generically, there are no intersections and no multiplicity of eigenvalues. Everything is really nice. Uh, now let's see what is known. Probably after 300 years, the first until recently the only result was the uh, Sturm oscillation theorem, which usually is presented in ODE, ordinary differential equations classes, which says the following, that if you have, if you consider this 1D Schrodinger or sturm liouville operator of the type like you saw, for instance, yesterday, on a, a finite interval with Dirichlet conditions, the Sturm theorem says that if you take if you label eigenvalues in increasing, non-decreasing order, that's the spectrum. So you H u equals lambda u, you write the equation. And these are corresponding eigenfunctions. Then the nth eigenfunction changes the sign exactly n minus 1 times. And this is the picture, for instance, uh, of the second eigenfunction. It changes sign only once. So there is one zero and there are two nodal domains. Here it's negative, here it's positive. For instance, the ground state eigenfunction, which means psi 1, the lowest frequency eigenfunction, doesn't change sign, it's positive. Or negative, you can change the sign. And this is Wonderful result, you exactly know what happens, how many oscillations, how many nodal domains. Well, now look at the higher dimensional case. Uh, by the way, Ricardo, I am really bad at timing. So uh, control me, please. <laughs> uh, so let's look at the higher dimensional case. We have a domain, bounded domain, let's take smooth, nice uh, boundary, uh, all things are un unresolved in nicest cases. Uh, so again, you can think it's in 2D. And you have the Dirichlet boundary condition. And the boundary, and again, as before, we have eigenvalues lambda. Now it's convenient for me, for the future, to label them as functions of the domain. If you change the domain, lambda will change, right? So we have lambda 1 of omega, etc., and eigenfunction psi n. As before, zero set of eigenfunction is a nodal set. And if you throw away the nodal set, you get pieces which are called uh, nodal domains. And now new notation. Uh, that's the one I will be studying. Uh, new sub n is the number of nodal domains of the nth eigenfunction. So in for Sturm-Liouville, for 
one decays, Sturm's theorem says that nu n equals n period. There is an old theorem proved by current long time ago, and it's very simple uh, theorem to prove, that in any dimension, nu n cannot exceed n. In any dimension, you cannot have five nodal domains, or domains if you take the four eigenfunction. So it's always less or equal. It's very easy to prove using so-called relay ra ratio and, and choosing appropriate test functions. I will not do this, but it's very simple thing to prove. It's proven, for instance, in the famous uh, Courant and Hilbert's book on mathematical physics. Well, it looks like we are almost there. We only need to prove that it's equal, and we will be done. Well, there is a notion that eigenfunction is current sharp if nu n equals n, if the number in the spectrum equals the number of the domain. Well, Sturm theory theorem says that in dimension one, all eigenfunctions are current sharp. In any dimension, lambda one and lambda two are current sharp. Since lambda 1 is the lowest eigenvalue, in any dimension we can prove that there is no zero inside. So it's positive, there is only one domain. Then the second uh, eigenvalue, the second eigenfunction, they mu it must be orthogonal to the first. And if the first is positive, the second must have a zero, must have chain. On the other hand, we know it cannot have more than two nodal domains, since due to inequality, nu n is always, so nu 2 cannot be bigger than 2. On the other hand, it should be at least 2, since it should change sign. So lambda 2 is current sharp. And that's it. We cannot guarantee anything else. We cannot guarantee anything else. Moreover, we shouldn't even try. Since there is a theorem much more sophisticated famous theorem by Pliel that says that if dimension is bigger than one, and if you go far in the spectrum, if you take large n, this new n cannot reach n. It's less than 0.7 n. That's it. Which means that if you go far, you won't find any current sharp eigenfunctions. In other words, what we saw in 1D can happen in higher dimensions only finitely many times. It happens for lambda 1, for lambda 2, and maybe <laughs> no more. But you might be lucky and find five more current chart eigenfunctions, but only finitely many. So the things are completely different. So the conclusion is that current sharp eigenfunctions are rare. You can have only finitely many. You always have two, but maybe not more. So this leads to the notion of nodal deficiency. If you subtract for n from n, which uh, we would have if the world w were really nice, if, if the Sturm theorem whole could hold in any dimension, minus what it really has. So this is nodal deficiency. How far, how much less eigen, uh, nodal domains you have than the number in the spectrum you see. For instance, if you have, if you take tens eigenfunction and you found only three nodal domains, the deficiency is seven. Well, so, uh, in fact, it can go really bad. It can go really bad. You can have very few nodal domains. And this was discovered by uh, one of the PhD students of Courant. And you can find example in, in the same book, Courant and Hilbert, that no matter how large n is, you can find examples with only two nodal domains. 
And here is the picture that you would see in Courant and Hilbert. That's an example of very large N on the square. This is nodal set. And there are only two nodal domains, one starting from here and one starting from there. You can trace and see there are only two of them. So it can go pretty bad. So nodal deficiency will be n minus 2. By the way, Courant has never been known for acknowledging easily the results of other people. So if my, my memory doesn't uh, let me down, which it does very frequently, uh, he doesn't mention who did this, who got this example, but <laughs> the PhD thesis of this guy is available in getting in the library. Okay, so now what's going on? It, has, it had looked till very recently that nodal discrepancy, discrepancy is something really uncontrollable. It's some kind of weird number that can jump up and down and no regularity is observed, and uh, it, it looked like it, doesn't, it probably doesn't mean anything, which happened to be wrong, as I will try to show. But the simplest question is, okay, you have examples of rare eigenfunctions very far in the spectrum where you have uh, nodal count very small. But you expect that if you go, but this should be rare eigenfunctions. If you look at all eigenfunctions, probably there are weird ones with few nodal domains, but you should accumulate more and more nodal domains. In other words, here is a natural conjecture formulated by Hoffman Ostenhoff that if you take limbs, oh, it should be n, not j. Uh, yeah. If you re have read miscellanea, Mathematical Miscellanea by Littlewood, he says that mathematician says A writes B means C, but it should have been D. Yeah, so that's what you see. <laughs> I'm only halfway through. So Lim's, Lim's soup is infinity. So you can have weird eigenfunctions with very few nodal domains, but it couldn't happen, for instance, that all eigenfunctions have no more than five nodal domains, or five million nodal domains. It should be possible to find eigenfunctions with very many nodal domains. Well, very good mathematicians, very, very strong mathematicians have tried. It's not proven. It's not proven in 2D for uh, Dirichlet, Laplacian in, in nice domain. It's not proven where you can compute explicitly in disk, uh, square, uh, those uh, crystallographic domains, it happens to be true when you can find the whole spectrum. But no one succeeded to prove it. There are only a couple of recent cases, all of them non-Euclidean, where those things were proven, for instance, by Peter Sarnak and some arithmetic domains, but his proof relies upon not Riemannian conjecture, but also some big unresolved <laughs> conjecture in number theory. His proof that the limb soup is infinity. So this is completely, uh, it's insultingly open problem. Uh, now, here is what you can say more positively. Not long ago, maybe 10 years ago, a little bit more, Bernard Herfer and Thomas Hoffman and Senkhoff suggested a different point of view to this. What instead of looking at your Laplace or Schrodinger operator in domain, you look at partitions as geometric objects. Look, uh, forget that, let's say this is nodal set with nodal domains, forget that it's nodal set. Look at it as a partition of your domain. And you pose a question, can this partition be partition, uh, nodal partition for an eigenfunction of your operator or not? It seems to be a weird question, since partitions can be 
it's it's a normal set, an infinite dimensional variety of partitions, but it is it happened to be useful. Certainly, you have to be smart. You you should impose conditions uh, that uh, nodal partitions have to satisfy. For instance, if this curve is not smooth, we know it cannot be nodal. So we we should allow only smooth curves. If the angles are wrong. They are not commensurate with 2 pi. It cannot be nodal, so eliminate those. For instance, if you hit the boundary, you, you should hit it at the angle 90 degrees. So let us impose all conditions. Consider partitions by piecewise smooth curves. Wherever they intersect, they make allowed angles. This is also not everything that we should require. There is, so again, this is the question that I formulated. Uh, and I already mentioned these guys. It has to be smooth, correct intersection angles. We include this in definition of partition. But there is one more thing. It should be what is called bipartite, which means that you should be able to color the pieces. You see these are nodal pieces. You should be able to color them into black and white, into two colors, without without conflicts. In other words, two domains that border each other should have different color. It's not always possible. Why is it true? Since if you, uh, let's say, let us color in black the domains where your eigenfunction is positive and in white when it's negative. I claim you cannot have black and black on both sides. Why? Since if you have black here and black here, and you have here and here, zero here, you will have uh, a function, actually like a harmonic function, uh, which is positive here and here, and zeros in, in between. But this will contradict maximum principle. This will contradict maximum principle. It cannot happen. Eigenfunctions, when they cross a nodal set, they have to change sign. Therefore, for instance, this partition shouldn't be allowed. This partition shouldn't be allowed, although it has the right angles and smoothness and everything. But you cannot, it's not bipartite. Okay, so now we set our space of partitions. We allow those smooth, correctly intersecting, and bipartite partitions of your domain omega. And you have in mind your operator. Rather, it's, Lapl it's either Laplacian in this domain with Dirichlet conditions, or maybe even Schrodinger, you can add potential. And there is one more thing to notice, that if it is nodal partition of your, uh, let's say, nth eigenfunction, let's say this is a nodal partition of eigenfunction psi n. Then look, forget the whole domain, and look only at one of the nodal pieces. What happens on the boundary? The function is zero, right? Since it's, that's how we define this boundary. And it, it doesn't change sign, which means that it is the lowest eigenvalue, eigenfunction, for, La, for Laplacian, if you define it only here, forget the whole domain, define Laplace operator with Dirichlet boundary conditions on this domain. So we do satisfy the equation since we satisfy it everywhere. We do have Dirichlet boundary condition, and there is no sign change. Therefore, what we conclude, that this eigenvalue, which was the nth eigenvalue for the whole domain, is the first eigenvalue for this piece. So if you do not those pieces omega 1, omega n, these are nodal domains. We conclude that lambda 1 of each nodal domain is equal to our lambda n of the whole domain. Is it clear why? Since uh, on each of the nodal domains equation which we have in the whole domain, it holds everywhere. The boundary condition 0 is satisfied since it is the, by definition, zero set of your function. And it doesn't change sign inside, so it must be the first one. 
So that's, that's what we call equipartition. Equipartition is the, the partition where uh, the lowest eigenvalues of each piece equals the nth eigenvalue of the whole. And now what Ho Helfer and Hoffman Ostenhoff suggested, they suggested consider the following functional on partitions. So P is now a partition. Oh, you, you have fixed domain. You have your operator. You, you consider all allowed partitions. Bipartite, smooth with correct angles, partitions. And consider the following functional. You take the lowest eigenvalue in each of those pieces and take maximum over all pieces. That is their functional. Then they prove the following amazing theorem. That first of all, they prove that this functional attains minimum on the uh, on those partitions. I fix the number of domains. Also. So here uh, they proved that this functional has minima on this awful complicated space of partitions. And the minimal points, if they're bipartite, they might happen to not to be the bipartite. If they're bipartite, they are exactly nodal partitions of current sharp eigenfunctions. So the minima points of this functional, it's kind of energy functional, are exactly all partitions, but unfortunately only of current sharp eigen functions that we know there are only finitely many of them. So something happens with uh, everything er else. But it's amazing theorem and it's very hard to prove. Uh, in particular you have to do some minimization where you have to prove that minimum does exist and is achieved etc. So it's it's difficult theorem. But what it bothersome that okay we now we can tell which partitions among this wild variety of partitions correspond to nodal partitions of eigenfunctions, but only of current sharp, which is very few. Well, what happens with, with others? And this is a, first of all, the answer was obtained by these three mathematicians. Some of them physicists, some mathematicians, Banberg, Kalaika, and Smilansky, in 2011. In the case not of a domain, but in the case of what is called quantum graph. Quantum graphs are kind of quasi one dimensional objects. They are graphs, but along each edge you have an ordinary differential equation. I will not get into this. These are, this is very good uh, test case. Quantum graphs, uh, they are somewhere between uh, discrete systems, ODEs, and PDEs. They kind of have some properties of partial differential equations, some of ordinary differential equations, some of the combinatorics of graphs. And for those, they found some interesting answer. And then we pushed it further and Billiard case, it's just, I should have removed it. Billiard means Laplace operator with Dirichlet z zero boundary on domains. So we could d do this for domains, namely, so now we consider partitions, but only equipartitions. Equipartition, I remind you, the ones where lambda one is the same everywhere. Lambda one of each piece is the same. And look at the at generic ones. Generic, I remind you, means that there are no intersections. Everything is nicely smooth, no intersections. And the natural thing is, in the case of uh, uh, Helfer and Hoffman Ostenhoff, they looked at minima. What if you look at critical points, other critical points? Not minimal. Functionals might have more, many critical points. The problem is that their functional is not smooth. 
on the space of partitions. It's not smooth. So it's kind of a hairy thing to do. But if you take equipartitions, we proved that you can equip the space of such equipartitions with a structure of infinite dimensional, smooth, actually analytic Hilbert manifold. So it's infinite dimensional, nice manifold. And then function, their functional is smooth there. And there is no issue with critical points. Uh, restriction to equipartitions it doesn't hurt since, if you remember, every nodal partition must be equipartition. You should look among others. They will not be nodal partitions. Okay, uh, so what we found that critical points give you nodal partitions of all eigenfunctions. Minima that they were looking for were given notable partitions only of Kur and Sharp ones. Here you get all of them. Moreover, you get the formula. The Morse index of this critical point is exactly the nodal deficiency of, of the, of the <laughs> eigenfunction. Now let me tell you what it's Morse index. So if you have it's the same in infinite, finite dimensional and infinite dimensional setting. If you have some uh, function lambda of, of whatever it is, smooth function, and you have critical point, critical point means that the d first derivatives are zeros, but there is a s the matrix of second derivative, so-called Hessian. The Hessian is the matrix of of uh, all second derivative at the exterior point. If it's minimum, this matrix will be no, negative, but there are critical points like saddle points, so this matrix can have negative eigenvalues and positive eigenvalues, like if you are on a saddle here, you have in this direction, negative eigenvalues, in this positive. So the number of negative eigenvalues, or the dimension of the subspace where this, uh, this is self-adjoint matrix always. Uh, the number of negative eigenvalues, or the dimension of subspace where this Hessian is negative, is the Morse index. And so the claim is that all critical points are exactly all nodal partitions of eigenfunctions. Moreover, the Morse index of this critical point is equal to the deficiency. For instance, when you add the minimum, Morse index is zero. There are no... So Morse index tells you in which directions your functional decays. But if you add the minimum, there are no directions. So Morse index at the minimum is zero, and that's why nodal deficiency is zero. It explains why. Helfer and uh, Hoffman-Osterhoff got only current sharp eigenfunctions since the deficiency was zero. And so this is the, uh, the result that uh, tells, for instance, uh, at least ideologically, I cannot say it's very useful so far, but I can definitely say that it shows that nodal deficiency is not something really weird, that it has some underlying meaning. And those of you who have heard of more theory, you can expect that maybe some advances will come from this. There are obstacles still ahead, but uh, one can have, though at least it, it shows that this is not a weird, but a meaningful quantity, which has interesting structure. So how much time do you have? Oh, that's more than enough. So now I want to add some something to this. Uh, there are some deficiencies here. For instance, the assumption of generic equipartitions, uh, uh, genericity is not a very good assumption that we actually allow any interesting partitions where there are intersections. 
you disallow them. You say, okay, nearby there are good ones without intersection. So what happens at the intersection points is still not uh, known. So a few comments. First of all, we, as I said, we kind of put additional re re restriction which Hoffman, Nassim Hoffman, Helfer didn't have. We restricted ourselves to equipartitions only. We know that in the end, the answer should be equipartitions. But still, their functional is defined for non-equipartitions as well. Why did we restrict to equipartitions? Since I said it makes a nice infinite dimensional manifold of those partitions. It's a very nice object. However, if, you, if you, they start colliding, and uh, uh, where there are non-equi partitions, the functional that Helfer and others used is non-smooth. However, there is something about non-smooth functionals where you can define what critical point is. There is non-smooth analysis like that where you can define what is critical point, what is more syntax, and if you do this, you realize that the theorem holds without this assumption. Or that we just made our life easier d dealing with everything smooth when we only look at equi partitions. If we cross out the word equi, the same r thing uh, works. However, uh, if we, what happens that if you look at the space of all partitions, they don't form, not generic. We looked only at generic partitions. If you look at all of them, things go much worse, since it is not a smooth, even infinite dimensional manifold anymore. It has starts having singularities. Like, for instance, if you have an analytic function, or even polynomial, you look at set of zeros, they look like this. They look nice till they stop looking nice, till they have singularities. And condition of generic partition skips us on those smooth parts. What happens here if partitions come here, the, those nodal lines collide? And the whole space of, uh, of partitions is not any more an analytic or even smooth infinite dimensional manifold. It's what is called variety. And those of you who have worked, for instance, with algebraic geometry or several complex variables, analytic variety is exactly pictured like this. When you have something really nice analytic with singularities. And, and moreover, it's very nice variety. It is stratified. For instance, if you have these two nice pages, and then they collide and the, along this edge, and then there is another edge going this way. So you see, it is smooth analytic variety of dimension two on my picture here. Then it has another stratum, which is also nice, smooth. It has dimension one. And then there is a smaller stratum of dimension zero. So in other words, it's nice stratified manifold where big analytic pieces glued together to smaller dimensional, and those are glued together to smaller dimensional, etc. And we, I believe that we understand how to handle those things, uh, but it is still in progress. That's and there is a version of more theory adopted to stratified manifolds like that. When yeah. in topology it's called sometimes CW complex, but it's better. It's a, it has an analytic structure, like two-dimensional analytic piece glued to one-dimensional analytic piece, those one-dimensional glued to each other through zero-dimensional, etc. This is work in progress, I cannot guarantee. And there was significant 
uh, progress in in the graph case. Unfortunately, we no one has been able to do this on domains yet. What uh, what, what our results that I showed you says, it says that if you perturb partition, with respect to this perturbation, nodal partitions are critical point. But perturbing partition, it looks like a very complicated thing. You can, there are many ways you perturb, can perturb partition of a domain. What Berkalaika did in 2011 is then Colin de Verdier provided a different proof, only in the graph case. They showed that instead of changing the partition, which is kind of so hard to visualize and use, you can instead add small magnetic potential to your operator. When you do this, you add magnetic potential. I will not say what it is, but if you don't know, just skip it. Uh, it corresponds to the uh, presence of magnetic field. If you add um, small magnetic potential, magnetic potential with small parameter, then under this perturbation, your eigenvalue will perturb. But this is, is in graph case, finite dimensional perturbation, not infinite dimensional like in this unwieldy set of partitions. And they proved the relation between nodal deficiency and Morse index of this very physical, interesting, nice perturbation by magnetic potentials. However, unfortunately, not only there is no proof of analogous result for a domain, we don't even know how to formulate it. It looks like it will require something like subtracting two infinities to get finite answer, which is very standard thing in physics, uh, but here it probably would would require some techniques from for Neumann algebra states, trace. I don't know, but even the formulation we cannot formulate analog for. The, I mean, it would be very nice thing to have, but no one has done this. And there is uh, very recent work uh, only in archive now. By this author, they have uh, a different formula for from ours from for uh, the nodal deficiency. I just don't have time to describe it. It only also describes nodal deficiency as Morse index of some operator, but the operator is what is called Dirichlet Neumann operator. I I will not get into this. Uh, it's one of the main operators in inverse problems, but, but I will not, it will take too much time to formulate. But their paper is on archive. And that's all. Thank you very much. Well, any uh, questions? Well, uh, e oh, you have a question. So, uh, my question is the following, if uh, is, there is a connection of these nodal domains with some semi-classical uh, oh, cl semi uh, semi semi I properties. I, I doubt this since uh, I don't know such results, sometimes techniques are used, but I don't know such results and since Helfer is one of the first people who would do this, and apparently at least I don't know anything like that. Any uh, other question? Well, I in the quantum graph, which was the boundary condition? Was it Kirchhoff or for your quantum graph? Well, which boundary condition you use? Uh, you can do this for the various boundary conditions. I, d I even don't remember whether they probably allowed it definitely for Kirchhoff. I don't remember whether you can do for other conditions. Uh, for example, for uh, this equipartition issue, if it is Neumann in the domain, then... Uh, th th uh. That should be something, since... Uh. since well, uh, bad if it conditions, is... conditions, you can split the graph, right? for right. instance. But even in the domain, uh, 
How how will that depend on the boundary condition, the results? Oh, you mean uh, what? Suppose instead of Dirichlet, you gave it Neumann or Mix. Whether we can take different right. boundary conditions? Yes. Oh, that's uh, a very good question, and hard one. Uh, if you take, for instance, Neumann condition, the whole thing changes completely, since we used Dirichlet condition very significantly. Remember when we looked at this piece, we said that the function is zero there since it's a nodal set. And zero was exactly our Dirichlet condition. This doesn't happen to Neumann. So things are very different for Neumann. And uh, apparently nodal partitions are not good objects to study for Neumann. People use uh, different conditions. They used critical points connected by gradient flows. And these partitions are more amenable to you. There are recent results, also far from being complete, but these are more amenable to study. But um, it's very different for different boundary conditions. Everything I said was Dirichlet. pure Dirichlet. Uh, suppose also you have a very rough boundary, a fractal boundary eventually. How will that be reflected in the nodal sets? Uh, I don't know, and I d I'm not sure that people have looked at this, since we have so much trouble even with smooth boundaries <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> that I'm not sure anyone has looked. But what people have looked, it's not exactly that, but uh, I forgot to say, there is an important direction which is followed uh, by people from number theory, from physics, etc., about nodal domains of random eigenfunctions. Uh, yeah. When you combine, for instance, take random sums of eigenfunctions and look what can happen. And for those, uh, there are results, for instance, about the nodal, the limb soup of nodal count going to infinity, etc. There are very nice results about those, but it's kind of different. Uh, di di different world. Okay. It's it's mostly related to quantum chaos. Well, thank you. Any other question? Well, otherwise, thank you for this beautiful lecture. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>